All right, so this is Chris Thede, Managing Editor of Comarch Magazine, and we are on here with Pam Tushner. Am I saying your name right? Yes. Great. So I guess first thing, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, where you work, what your position is, and the, and the type of work that you and your firm does. Okay. Um, so hi, yes, I'm Pam Tushner. I'm the regional leader for California um, for DLR Group. We are architects, engineers, and in interiors, um, full service with um, 27 offices uh, domestically and three internationally. Okay. And um, one of the things that I got in your background is that you uh, became interested in architecture at, at a very early age. I wonder if you could um, kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, how that happened, um, you know, when you became uh, interested in architecture and then also talk a little bit about some of the resistance maybe that you encountered when you were when you were young. Um, sure. You know, I, I grew up in I grew up in the uh, Perry Mason and um, the Brady Bunch air. So watching watching Mr. Brady have that great cool office and that wonderful modern home, I think is probably the first thing that planted a seed that that I might like being an architect. I was good at math, I was good at science, so it seemed, and, and good at drawing, so it seemed like a, a, a good path to go, um, to go down. Um, parent, my parents supported it, I had high school uh, guidance counselors that supported it, but I bet you the thing that really cemented it, that to go to college, was um, a friend of my parents um, uh, provided the opportunity for me to go meet with a local architect. So I got to see his office and what he was working on. It, he was a smaller firm and it was predominantly residential, but he lent me a bunch of books. And I think this whole idea of, of taking books home and being able to read about architecture, and they, one of them I, in particular was on Frank Lloyd Wright, um, I think that cemented that I, I knew creating places and spaces for people was, was something that I was, was interested in. I th think in terms of resistance, when, when I went to school, the ratio was um, one female to 10 males. So, you know, it was good odds if you wanted a date, but it wasn't necessarily good odds if you were looking to develop, you know, ha have those typical friendships that you might be looking for in a, in a university. Nowadays, it's pretty much 50-50. So it's one female to one male. And so, and so I think that's phenomenal for our, our industry. It shows um, how, how much their, um, the women's touch when it comes to design is um, appreciated. It also shows how we've moved past the, that it's a male dominated um, field and, and that um, both men and women can work side by side. Okay, so um, one of the things that I had in my background is you, you got a little bit of uh, maybe resistance when you were young, people told you you might consider something else, is that correct? Uh, yes, because I, I grew up that women, you were a nurse or a teacher. Okay. Um, and may, maybe a secretary. Um, and that, that's what you did. And that's, you know, nobody, nobody questioned it. I grew up in a small, small little, uh, small little town. And, um, you know, even my mother kind of questioned it. So it was really making that step, getting, getting into a university. And, um, that was part of, I chose, I went to Temple University and I chose that because at that time, that program, you were automatically um, admitted into the architectural program. You didn't have to wait. You didn't have to wait two years. Um, so um, I remember saying to my mother, she kind of questioned me, are you sure you want to do this? And my response was, have, have I ever not done anything I said I was going to do? And she just kind of smiled and said, okay, fair enough. <laughs> and um, so I think, I think that was also very st standing up for yourself. That was probably my first like, yep, I'm going to do this come what, whatever's thrown at me. And, and lucky for me, I love it. it you know, it, you've got to really follow your passion. And I was able to determine that and find that out early. So I'm, I'm very lucky. Good. So, yeah. So talk about that. Um, you know, whether it's uh, women or anybody, um, you know, young people um, pursuing careers, whether it's in architecture or related fields like um, engineering or interior design or things of that nature. I guess why some why do you think it's important for uh, people to 
to, I guess, pursue those careers and maybe, you know, not be dissuaded uh, off of them if that's truly what they want to do? Uh, because I, I do, I do think we all bring something different to the table, what, whether um, what our gender is, how how we were brought up, um, ethnic ethnically, what we're exposed to. I think all those experiences build upon the the architecture, the places that we design. So you know, a lot of times we're we're involved really as a, as an architect an engineer or an interior designer you're you're trained to solve a problem and not every time it means that you're building something to solve that problem um, in some cases it, it could be that space in between um, it could be how, how do you arrange the the furniture what's the color that you use on the walls to make somebody feel safe and secure um, how, how do you how do you create spaces within a school so that you can learn better. So all of those really on a daily basis, we're, we're solving problems. Somebody is giving us a task and, and we're having, have the opportunity to solve it. Okay. So and Did you, answer your question. No, that's, that's good. Um, and, and you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, um, nowadays the, it's a pretty much a 50, 50 split uh, in the, in the architecture business in terms of men and women. And I've heard similar things. I've, talked to an architect who is also an adjunct professor at NC State, and he said that there's actually more women than men in, in the classes that he teaches and that kind of thing. But um, how does the, I guess, the industry benefit from that kind of uh, diversity, do you think? Um, well, look, I, I actually probably should clarify something. Um, that's, what, that's what's occurring in school. They come mm -hmm. out of school, they graduate, but a lot of times they don't necessarily stay in our industry okay. um, because they're, they're responsible for raising families. So I think that's where you're starting to see a change, right? We're, we're now at a point where there's shared opportunities um, between um, a, a husband and a wife or a wife and wife, and um, so, so that they're staying in the workforce and, and having, um, having impact. So that impact, um, I, I think that impact is we just look at things differently. Women think about things differently. They're comfortable. Uh, it's probably a bit of a stereotype, but I think we're comfortable balancing multiple things. Um, we, I, I find that I run in a meeting much more efficiently than sometimes my counterparts. And I think, you know, I think part of it is I'm, I'm ready. Part of it is my passion. I want to get on to the next thing, but also it's, you know, that planning piece of it. That's, I think that's part of my DNA, just as much as it is something that I was I was taught. Okay, so uh, I guess what advice would you have for uh, young women or even anybody kind of coming up in, through the profession, um, and you know as they get you know into the early to mid part of their careers, what advice would you have for them? I think it'd be comfortable, find your passion, because if, if you have a passion for it, you'll put in the time, you'll, you'll, you'll um, be excited about it. And I think opportunity comes from, comes from that passion. I think the other piece is it's okay to make a mistake and be, you know, we're going to make mistakes. Not everything is going to be perfect. And I think you, you just own up to it. Sorry about that. That's right. Um, I think that you just you just need to um, you know own. Okay, should I stop for a second? So you can no, you, you can keep going. Keep going. That's fine. Um, I um, I I think that sometimes we were we are we're taught to not admit that we made a mistake. I think in this day and age, I made a mistake. Learn from it. I always tell my staff. Fine. Let what we can fix it. We, you know, we can we can fix a bad decision. Actually, not making a decision is worse. Um, we we can fix it, but I just ask that you learn from it and don't make it again. So if you're going to make a mistake tomorrow, make a different mistake. Um, okay. You know, learn learn from those mistakes. So I think I think that's that's really important. And I you know we're not some of us aren't necessarily comfortable admitting that we've made a mistake. Okay. So let's let's shift gears here a little bit and talk uh, about uh, specifically some of the work and, and uh, types of projects that you have uh, been involved with 
um, either recently or, or anything that you want to um, highlight, I guess, talk about um, the type of work that you do, the type of, you know, if, if it's in particular, uh, you know, categories or not, or I guess just kind of talk about um, how you approach projects as, as an architect. Um, I've been predominantly involved in ed educational and institutional type projects. Um, so starting with institutional he healthcare type projects. And it it's so rewarding to um, sit at a table with a nurse and a doctor and talk about what they do and how do, you, how do we design the space, let's say the, the surgery room, to um, how, do, how do we design that so that they can do what they do the best and just tweaking where um, a table is or where a light is, um, all, of the, all of those things to make their job better. And then when you go back and you work on a patient, patient room and, and making sure where, that everything is aligned properly and, and then you see patients that, that thrived in that space. Um, and and, and um, did did well. So you know, I I enjoyed the healthcare part of it because I knew I was helping to make people better. Um, I think from an education point of view, there is nothing that we um, could could do that's more important than educating our future because these are the doctors and the lawyers and the and the teachers. These are the people that are going to take care of me as I as I get older and take care of my grandchildren. So it, it's just rewarding when you walk into a space and you've sat with somebody, you've sketched, and then and then it gets built and it meet and it um, meets meets all their expectations. We recently um, did some pro bono work for a um, uh, an insta uh, uh, um, a state that that works with um, children that have been abused. So children are are brought to this center. They're interviewed. Um, it was a it was a collaboration between um, it was a collaboration between a county, a hospital, and also um, uh, the sheriffs, so that they could interview the kids one time and not have to have multiple people talk to the kids about these terrible things that have been happened to happen to them. So that was really that um, opportunity for me to do medical and education and kind of come together. But I, I remember the, um, the, the, the teacher um, saying to me, or, or one, of the, one of the administrators saying to me, um, what, um, not liking something that we wanted to do. And I said to her, I'm telling you, this is the thing to do. The kids are going to love this. Please do this. And, and you know, still didn't want to do it. So finally, at some point, I said to her, you know what? If you don't like it. I'll pay to rip it out and we'll replace it. And she goes, really? You feel that strongly about it? I said, yes, I feel that strongly about it. So she talked about that when they opened up the facility, how she thought this was the ridic most ridiculous idea and that it was all about their branding and how it really worked with the kids. And it was one of the things that they talk about when they came to the facility. So it was, it was, you know, that to me, that's rewarding. That's when I get to see kind of that start to finish. Um, and, and it's exceptionally rewarding. Okay. And what was, what was the, what was that facility? Um, it was for the count, actually the County of San Bernardino. Okay. Um, I can, I can find out the exact name for you if you'd like. Yeah. And do, do you have any um, photography of this, this element that you were talking about or? Anything, I guess anything more you can say to sort of describe it? Well, this was actually their, this was their branding. So we, we um, what we did is we, we branded each one of the rooms with, with colors and names. And then we used those same images with the flooring. So, um, so that you would say, you know, you're going to go to the purple room or the, or the orange room. And they were so used to everything would just be monotone and there wouldn't be any color. Well, when you're okay. dealing with children, you need something, they need something bright. And, you know, so they're running down the hall and they're looking for the orange carpet because they're going to go into the orange room. Okay. So as, as you and I are speaking right now, and I want to shift gears here a little bit, but as you and I are speaking right now, it's late April in 2020 and we're um, kind of in the midst of the whole, uh, COVID-19 pandemic and things like that. 
And you spoke about, you know, the types of buildings that you um, oftentimes work on are educational or healthcare. And those are two types of buildings that are, you know, months from now, um, after the pandemic is over, are going to have, you know, perhaps some changes or in the way uh, designers and architects approach them and builders and so forth. I guess, do you have any thoughts on this in terms of what things might look like, you know, what buildings might look like, particularly uh, the types of buildings that you work on um, in a, in a post COVID-19 world? Yeah. You know, we're, we've been talking about what's it going to be like to come back to our offices to work. Um, and because we're, our offices are, are, are going to change. So this is a great, great question. Um, you know, w one of the first things is really going to be about those touch points. Um, door, you know, you're, you're going to find that doors are going to be open or they're going to be automatic. Um, we're going to have, um, you know, a faucet that is, is, isn't is touchless. It's just probably not, not going to exist anymore. I think how we already design our bathrooms in a lot of our high schools to not have a door on them so that you can hear from a sound point of view um, if something was happening. So I think we're gonna start seeing those things that we're doing at the high school level start to come down to um, an elementary um, level. But spaces will probably, spaces will either have to get bigger to accommodate uh, um, some more social distancing um, or, or, or our class sizes are gonna have to be smaller to accommodate, accommodate it. Um, I think that you were going to start to see hallways are going to be larger so that you can have two-way traffic and that, that people can pass each other and, 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 feel, and feel comfortable. We already do a lot of, space, a lot of um, outdoor spaces that are used for learning. And I, think, and I suspect if, if the climate allows, we're, we're going to see more and more of those. Um, just because it's going to allow you to get out in the fresh air, it, it will give you some some social um, distancing, but probably walking into the build, walking into a building and us putting our hands underneath something and getting sanitizer is probably going to start to be the new norm in many ways. Um, how you know elevators where we don't push any buttons anymore and everything is card keyed. Um, so I think all the electronics and those touch points, all those things are going to change. And then some of our spaces are going to um, either need to um, grow or we're going to have to change, change the furniture to make them, um, to make them allow for, for a little more social distancing. And, and I think actually less people are going to come back to our offices. Um, we many people are finding that they can they can work from home. It's a challenge for those where the children aren't in school and they're being a teacher. You know, they're being a teacher, they're being a parent, and then they're also trying to get their work done. Um, so I think there's there's still going to be that challenge. But once stu when students do go back to school, um, I think we're going to find that people aren't going to want to come into the office so much that we've learned how to work work together better um, remotely. There's still those individuals that, you know, they so from a social point of view, they don't work well. They want to get out of the, out of their their um, home space and come back into the office. Um, so I think you'll see a third of the staff that are like that. You're going to see another third that say, "Hey, wait a second, I can completely do my job or most of it remotely." And you're going to get another third that are going to want to go do that, um, go both ways, right? I want to be in the office a couple days. I want to work from home. What, why, why should I telecommute? Um, so I, um, it, it's going to be, it's, I don't really think any of us have what that new norm is, is going, going to be figured out. But I, I was thinking the other day, I wonder if a handshake is going to go by the hand side, wayside. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I grew up being taught how to shake someone's hand and so that you did it with some force, right? And you looked someone in the eye. You know, now are we going to be teaching that, hey, you hit somebody with their elbow and you look them in the eye? You know, what, what, is, what are our grandchildren going, or what are my grandchildren going to be taught that are just so different from what I'm used to? Um, I used to laugh that my mother would, uh, didn't know what a microwave was or a television. How do you not, you didn't grow up with a television or a microwave? Because those were norms for me. Um, and I just kind of wonder what's that norm going to be um, going forward. And I think we're going to use more technology for connection and moving through spaces than we ever have before. 
Do you, do you think the, um, and I hear what you're saying about more people working from home perhaps, and I, I wonder how much of that might also extend to the education side of things, especially higher education where, you know, online learning and, and distance learning and that kind of a thing. Yeah, I, people might be, might be learning that, you know, it's maybe not so bad in some cases. I think, I think you're right. From a higher um, education, it already exists. For some people, you know, that that maybe have a job and they they're trying to do both, or because of um, limitations, or quite frankly, online learning connects us to thought leaders that we may never have had the opportunity on a regular basis to connect with. Um, so I, I think you'll start to see that it, it will be um, become a little more affordable, and it will be something that probably will be used a, a, a little bit more. But, but, I, but, you know, we've got some young professionals in our office that are not going to have a formal graduation from college. Mm -hmm. And they're missing out. Um, and, or, or if nothing else, they think they're missing out on something. So I do think some of those, um, I don't know, rite of passages maybe, or those things that really are a milestone, they're going to need to happen. We, I think we have to be careful that we don't all grow up is a bunch of people that are really buried in our phones or on our computers and aren't comfortable, um, you know, aren't comfortable speaking or aren't comfortable socializing with somebody. You know, I'm, I'm ready to go back to work. I'm ready to put on shoes and, you know, get out of wearing socks and wearing sweats. And, and I think that there are, I, I suspect that there's a lot of other individuals that are ready for that also. Okay. Well, good. Thank you very much. Um, those are all the questions that I have. Is there anything, I guess, before we uh, end here, is there anything else that you wanted to add, be either on that topic or what we were talking about before, um, as far as um, women in architecture and things of that nature? Um, no, probably not necess necessarily. You know, I just, I, I love what I do. Um, and, um, and I have Part of why I love to do is that people have allowed me to be exposed to many things and, and make some mistakes and change from one thing to another. And, and I think this is one of those professions that whether you're in the design side or you're in the build side, you know, you'll see people that start in one and go to another. It's just, it's a wonderful profession because there's just so many avenues and places to plug in. So I appreciate you um, spending some time with me, Chris, and talking. and. Um, uh, it's, um, I, I appreciate that you're, you're spreading the word, so thank you. 